Let me introduce today's fighters. In the red corner, at 55 years of age, with Dunedin pace of 0.65, she could be your grandma by age, but your girlfriend by looks, Julie Gibson Clark. Yay. In the blue corner, the ultimate biohacker, donning 170 pills a day, 61 years young, with a Dunedin pace of 0.66, David Pasco. And in the green corner, the rookie challenger, who got everything a man could wish for, youth, health and fame, ranked fourth in the Rejuvenation Olympics leaderboard. 27 years old with a Dunedin pace of 0.62, Seam Land. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> the very first panel conversation of the Immortal Combat. I thought we were only going to go by our epigenetic ages, not our chronological, but that's okay. I'm actually 30 almost now, so in, in a few yeah. weeks I'll get 30. So. You are so oh, happy birthday. <laughs> happy Anna's birthday. When is that? Yes. It's in uh, 16 September. Oh, okay. Nice. okay. October 12th, I'll be 56. So. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so we have to have Dave? parties on both of those days. Well, I was going to say, Dave just had a birthday, so yay. Yeah, just last week. <laughs> wow. Nice. 62. Happy belated. 62. Looking good. Well, Brian Johnson is celebrating his birthday based on the need and pace, so it's not every year. Don't you guys want to do the same? It's going to be hard to count it, or, you know, how do you track that? Yeah, right? It's like a lunar calendar kind of thing, trying to track that. That would be crazy. <laughs> Well, it's even harder because your pace of aging, it changes in every, I don't know, maybe moment, uh, but definitely every day. So, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's, inter that's hard to count for sure. Mine is certainly all nice, that's for sure. Okay. Let's get down to business here. I want to start with, a, with an insightful question and please answer in any order you find your own answers to this the same question to everyone how much time do you think you have left oh how much time do i think i have left well i'm hoping for 50 more years at least and solid years you know i mean i don't want 50 years and 20 of them to be completely frail so i'm hoping that's what I'm training for, 50 more years at least. According to my grim age, I'm I'm going to check out on Friday. <laughs> I have I have no idea. Yeah. No Just want to live as healthy as possible until the day I drop, whenever that's going to be. Right. Yeah, it's like you 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 never know when, or it's like I think wrong focus to have like how much time you have left because you never know when it's going to happen, and even if, if it does happen, then you know. It just everything disappears, so you don't even have the recollection of uh, the past memories. So you you literally don't have anything else <laughs> left. So you don't even know that it had happened. So like you know, it could happen like you know every second, and then there's nothing even to interpret that it had happened, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think there's nothing like really tangible to like think about it because it, a lot of it comes to, like I'm af I'm afraid of like the death or that uh, there's not enough time left but the reality is when it happens then you don't have no idea that it had happened <laughs> so it, ju it just stops <laughs> existing this idea of yourself so there's nothing like really scary there's no nothing to be scared about it actually i was to say like you know plan for the worst and hope for the best i mean you know the worst that could happen is that i live another 50 years and god forbid i'd be frail but um mm. you know I'm going to hope for that, but unfortunately, I know all too well that I could walk out tomorrow, I could be out walking and hit by a car, you know, that these things happen. So it is kind of silly to put any sort of numbers on it, but, you know, I'm going to work out and eat as if I'll be healthy for the next 50, 50 years. Yeah, I'm not going to focus on don't die. I'm going to focus on live life. Yeah. yeah, I like that. No one, no one had a very ambitious ambitious response here i i want to pick up on something that seem said here that uh, 
the, the, the fear of non-existing, right? Like, how do you imagine not existing? It's, uh, it's, it's kind of like what came before you, right? Before you born. Well, depends on your religious beliefs, right? But, um, well, I see Dave wanted to, wanted to add something to that. So go yeah. ahead. <laughs> I don't know. I just think at some point we return to our source, whatever that is, whatever you believe that to be. And I don't know if that's conscious or unconscious. I, I don't know. I'd like to think it's conscious. Well, there is something that's less religious about the fear of death, which is not the, not your, your existence, but it's about the events leading up to your death. That's what many people are fearing. How do you guys think about that? Are you guys fearing your death in that sense? Yeah, like I said earlier, like I've had this thought over the past few weeks or something like, so what is like when you die? So usually my, people might have this kind of idea that they die and then they kind of exist in this, I guess, memory chamber that like stores their previous life memories and they suffer because they can't continue or they're like stuck somewhere. But, you know, the reality is when you're dead, then you don't even have your memories. <laughs> so you don't have anything. Yeah, like you said as well, like you, we, we had no, no idea what it was like before we were born. And we have no idea what it's, what it's going to be like after we die as well. So it's literally like, it's almost like, yeah, you have nothing to kind of fear because you're not going to be there to kind of experience it. <laughs> so if you don't have like, and depends again, yeah, like on your religious beliefs, you know, what happens to your consciousness after you die or whatnot. But uh, at least like, you know, this kind of idea that death is something to be scared of. If you like really think about it in, in a deeply way that then, because there's nothing that would like experience death. We don't know what it would be, fe what it feels like to experience being dead, because then there's nothing that is going to be there to experience it. Uh, at least that's my view, that it's just, you know, you're dead and there's nothing <laughs> there's nothing like that uh, kind of happens so there's not uh, yeah like literally nothing to kind of be uh, afraid of uh, either in my in my eyes at least i don't see anything to be afraid of either but i just i know um when my brother died that was like 11 almost 12 years ago and uh it was very tragic and i just remember after he died like feeling like very powerfully that he was sitting next to me every morning like I was you know having tea every morning and just I always got up very early so I could have some time before my son woke up and I just kept getting this sense that he was with me and it was like always like well this is your life you know and it w but there was always this sense of like like I'm not going to be here forever like and I just kept being like a I don't know a physics person I kept thinking like I wonder if like our solid form is this life. And then we sort of go up to this, you know, almost like ice cubes, you know, you become an ice cube and then you melt back into like, like the water of the ocean. I just kind of wonder if that's what there's sort of this weird thing up there we call conscious consciousness or whatever we call it, but that, you know, for whatever reason, our soul for lack of a better way of saying it, like returns to that. And almost like, I just, I got, again, I keep thinking of like water and ice, like we're, you know, become these ice cubes is like our life and then we sort of melt and become this gaseous whatever and join this other thing whatever that is and i don't think any of us really know any of that for sure but that's just kind of the way i've put my head around it and um continue to feel my brother around me when i you know miss him but i, I know he's not there like he used to be like right after he died he was very much next to me let, let, let me pose the challenge here what julie was moving on to is not your death but the death of others because you guys are in a prime position of out leaving most of your peers and friends and family if you continue on the path that you take and upon so so how does that make you feel you know, I'll take this. I'm the only person I don't want to outlive is my son. That's the only, you know, like everybody else. I don't like, I love the challenge of meeting new people. I mean, I'm that person that can just, you know, drop me in a, a village where I know nobody and I don't even know where, you know, like I will end up knowing people. And so I love that challenge. Um, Cause I, I think that that would be the only thing I would be concerned about is, you know, in that sense of losing longtime 
friends and family members. But um, I hope that like along the way, I'm still continuing to build relationships with the people very much alive around me. The only, like I said, the only person that would just be so unnatural is to lose my son before, before me. Yeah. Well, he's uh, fortunately like young enough that he's, he'll probably reap the most benefits from this yeah. future uh, technology. So yeah. Yeah. He's 17 and already kind of starting down this health path, which is brilliant. So yeah, I think, you know, for the, uh, for the for your like family members it's much worse so if you die or you know because like we don't know what it's like being dead but we know what it feels like if someone in, in our family or for friends has died and so the, you know that feeling is probably much worse than the feeling of like being dead because yeah like you, you don't really like you know feel it kind of let's move on to a bit a bit uh, lighter topics which is which is about maybe your the dynamics in between you guys and Julie you mentioned you have a son and you might have some experience in in raising him and here is someone <laughs> who is 30 years old who could be your son so I was wondering if you have some advice to give to Sim advice like as if you were my son oh gosh <laughs> That's, I don't know Sim yet, so that's going to be, that would be hard. I'd have to base that on, you know, but I know that like with my son, I'm always telling him to, you know, relax, it'll be okay. You know, tomorrow's another day. What you worry about today, you will have forgotten a little bit later, you know, so try not to stress the, and don't sweat the small stuff. That's what I tell him, but he needs that, you know, he's, he tends to be more on the anxious side. So I bet sim is like this but you know he pushes himself really really hard so um you know that's always my advice to him but um i suppose to everybody it's just to you know, be be good people like work to just love the people around you and i think that's you know the universal laws all right maybe after this conversation you will have some more context on sim Another another interesting thing is the relationship between you, Julie, and, and Dave. I'm, I know you guys have talked about it many times before, but this is the first time you are in the same podcast, so it might be worth reiterating how you guys are connected. Well, I think I've mentioned Julie in every single podcast I've ever been on, so this is the first time I don't have to mention you. You're right here, so it's it's awesome. Thank you for that, Dave. I appreciate it. Well, I'll, I'll share. So um, after my podcast with Ben Greenfield, I think Dave, you were in Italy and he reached out to me on Instagram and um, it was so nice to just, like I said, I, I think I've said this on other podcasts, but I've kind of been alone on this journey as far as health is concerned. And most of my family and friends think I'm completely nuts, you know, like, can you just shut up already about all the little things you discovered? So um, it's really, really nice to be like, oh, hey, what do you think about this? Or like, like, I know Dave's done exosomes, which I haven't picked your brain about this yet, Dave, but it's like, I'm wanting to return to run running again. So it's like, oh, you know what, maybe that'll help my hip. And maybe I can start running again, because I kind of gave it up because of my hips. And anyway, um, it's just nice to have um, somebody to bounce something off and I hope Sim and I get to know each other a little better too and um, I'm sure the time zone will make it a little difficult but um, I do plan on spending more and more time in Europe as soon as my son graduates so be over your way yeah and, and I felt the exact same way because mm -hmm. you know my my friends they just kind of glaze over when I talk about any of that stuff um, if they hear about something they're like oh is that that weird thing that Dave does and they'll be like so, yeah, I don't really have people I can talk to about it either. So finding you and just being able to just talk about good food and clean living and, you know, and rucking and just, I don't know, just, it was great. It was just, it really felt like a kindred spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Likewise. And I have a feeling that most of the longevity leaders on the leaderboard are going to have that in common. So I think that's awesome that we're all getting the chance to get together. Yes. And how is it for you? Like, do you have lots of friends that... Like you talk with this stuff, like are, is your circle of friends kind of all into longevity or are you sort of the one leading the pack and they're rolling their eyes? <laughs> um, well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm married to like a longevity enthusiast as well. So that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a good thing. So like 
we're actually at like our second anniversary, winning, winning our anniversary in, in a few days. So, yeah, I mean, that is very easy in that sense that we both, you know, like healthy food. We both exercise. We both go to bed at <laughs> early at the same time. I remember like two years ago or something, we had like a trip to Tenerife, just like a vacation. And uh, in the hotel, like we were already in bed at like, you know, what was it like 9.30 or 10, 10 p.m. And uh, you could hear downstairs that all the pensioners, the seniors were preparing for the bar and uh, the <laughs> the music in the in the hotel. And uh, so, yeah, we were already going going to sleep before they were heading out to like the bars or whatever. But yeah, I mean, I think it's very convenient for both of us that we're both like, you know, interested in health and uh, w want to take care of our like longevity in the future with with like regards to other friends then i guess i'm also like in a this position where i know a lot of people uh, who are also like into like the longevity side so i always have someone like to talk to <laughs> about these things but yeah e even then like it, it never like phases me in that sense like i've always you know done what i want to do <laughs> with my own health uh, regardless of what other people think yeah me too me too i mean i just i just feel like i've been siloed though you know as far as like well i have this question or that question and it's just off to search google so it's nice to be able to bounce it off people that may have that experience already and like oh i tried that or this wasn't so effective like i was speaking with somebody yesterday who had done like over 50 sec sessions of age pot and i was like well did that work and you know, mm. they said, yeah, it was great, but long-term, not so much, you know, wasn't necessarily worth the investment because um, the, the effects seem to have worn off, you know, the kind of feel-good effects, I suppose. Um, mm. So it was just nice to hear that, like, oh, okay, well, that might be something I could put lower down on my list. I've actually got a series spot sessions lined up. I'm, I'm going to LA here next week and I'm going to Radfest, the conference. Nice. And then while nice. I'm there, I'm getting a for Nuvo full body scan. And then I'm going to Dr. Joy Kong's clinic and getting stem cells. And so awesome. after the stem cells, I've lined up, you know, a series of HBOT sessions because that's good. Help the proliferation of the stem cells through my body. Well, what does that do? The stem cells? The stem cells? Regenerative, the regenerative properties, bringing more to a more youthful state. I'm doing it as a therapeutic thing, not a longevity thing because I have rotator cuff issues in the shoulder and uh, injuries in this elbow. So yeah, I'm getting a therapeutic dose, hopefully to heal that up. But I know have you done, have you done it before? No, this would be the first time I did exosomes. Um, gosh, okay. just a couple of months ago and I felt terrific. I mean, immediately I was able to sleep on this shoulder for the first time ever, which was great. But then I felt so good when I came home, I have a, a set of Olympic rings like gymnastic rings in my backyard hanging from my tree and i mm. like to do like inverse chins and, and dips and things on those i felt good enough that i could do that of course i went out and started playing around and screwed the shoulder up immediately because <laughs> even though it felt great it still takes weeks for the healing really to, to set in and i i did it way too early so mm. it was dumb live and learn i seem to keep <laughs> having to learn the same things over and over again through life you know <laughs> Yeah, give me the head of the baseball bat. Someday I'll learn. So I'm going to go really easy after getting these stem cells and, and try to do everything correctly. But we'll see. I'm pretty dumb sometimes. Go hard or go home. <laughs> so <laughs> um, the thing that brought us together is the Rejuvenation Olympics. And Dave and Julie, you guys have been well known since you've achieved good places on those leaderboards how did your life change you want to say i mean not much except for just in this positive sense like having so many different people to talk to about this as well as i've always had this conviction of helping the people around me you know which was always my reason to just sort of share like hey there's this there's that like to help people feel good and so um it's nice now that you know they say like never offer advice if people haven't asked for it and so 
you know, if your friends aren't asking for it, you probably should just, you learn to just kind of be quiet. But if people reach out to me, I'm more than happy to, you know, share my experience or some insight that might be helpful to them. And so it, it is nice to have a place to direct that energy so that it's, it's, it's all been very, very positive, I guess, for me and creating more relationships that around a topic that I care so much about. Yeah. For me, I mean, not much has changed in my, you know, my day-to-day life. The routines are still pretty much the same. I'm just, I'm still floored by the fact that anyone at all is interested. You know what I mean? <laughs> just based on the friends and the people in my life who, and like you said, we do the eye, they do the eye rolling or it's like, oh, it's that weird stuff that you do. The fact that people were interested and wanted to talk to me or, or do an interview, it's just, it just boggles my mind. So I love that. But I think my life has been far busier lately because of, you know, all the interviews and setting up the website. It's, it's turned into a whole nother retirement career that I never expected. So it's, it's a good thing. I'm just trying to deal with it because you don't usually like being the center of attention, I'm actually kind of shy. Um, people have told me that this doesn't come off in interviews because I probably talk too much. Yeah, this is just a really weird feeling for me. So I'm still trying to slowly get acclimated to it. I guess you noticed, and actually this is for everyone, even for Sim. So even I noticed that people are asking me things, what to do, how to do it. How do you guys handle the responsibility there that you are giving them advice? The way I frame it is that I like kind of root everything I say on like some evidence in uh, some scientific like studies or something like that so like I don't really go out of my way to say some like crazy things (laughs) online regarding like food or supplements or something like that so I've yeah tried to make a make a more yeah like evidence-based uh content in that sense to not jump to conclusions re- regarding supplements or not yet yeah, promote some sort of um, I guess extreme views on you know diet or exercise like nowadays you can find extreme opinions about like everything like is sunscreen bad or is the sunlight bad <laughs> is our carbohydrates bad or is meat bad is dairy bad are seed oils bad etc so like they all tend to have like a very this uh binary view so like you're either pro sunscreen or you're anti sunscreen <laughs> so there's no like middle ground almost or you're pro seed oil or you're against seed oil so there's like like no common sense ground in there so yeah I've, yeah i've tried to make it more i share what i do obviously a little bit Uh, But I, in the content, I always like, you know, share the evidence as well for whatever I'm claiming. And in like my books as well, like they're kind of heavily referenced to like studies. So I never like make things up. (laughs) So and in some sense, it makes it a bit more boring because it, there's no like this, like uh, spicy takes or there's no like very crazy (laughs) opinions that I have. Uh, That's because there's very rarely that you can find like this very conclusive uh, proof to something like even like smoking the the evidence that smoking is you know causally linked to cancer and heart disease it's not like a hundred percent proven but it's the link is so strong that it's, it feels like you know kind of common sense <laughs> to say that it is causal and with everything else the kind of the uh i guess the uh, assuredness is much much weaker so like the evidence between like meat or heart disease or longevity or seed oils and longevity is much weaker than it is for smoking so there's a lot more like nuance there than it is with uh, smoking yeah i would say i mean i'm pretty i certainly do not go offering or making claims that i would like sim says like would need evidence-based type of claims or you know i've had people reach out to me a lot of women like what about hormones or this or that i mean Obviously, I can't help them with that, except for to just say, you know, here's how to find a functional medicine doctor or and just try to stick to the stuff that's generally agreed upon as safe. You know, like, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to get hurt by eating vegetables and, you know, keeping their diet pretty um, like even keeled, you know, like I'm not a Mm. vegan or anything like, you know, I 
keep everything pretty balanced. And so I'm more into helping people find the motivation and the, um, the way to implement whatever health things they want to implement that I, I can't, I mean, I can't say how many times I've referred people to like, Hey, you should check out this study or you should check this out or, you know, and let them make their own opinions. I think that's important because I think that we all have an internal compass for lack of a better way of saying that, that like will guide you to like, mm, I think like, for instance, for me, like I, I'm sure the studies will all say that coffee is super good for you. And I, and I imagine it's very good for your brain, but for my body, it's not good. Uh, it's very hard on my joints. It causes all kinds of same thing with dark chocolate. So, you know, and it just took me kind of trial and error to figure that out. So I can't imagine ever saying, well, you should very much be on this or do this because everybody's biochemistry is different. Everybody's, you know, genet like their genetics their epigenetics, where they're at in their journey is different. So I think it's just kind of learning how to meet somebody where they're at and help them find whatever it is that they're looking for. Um, not so much offering blanket advice as, you know, you should do this and you should do that. Mm. Plus it, that just adds more stress. I feel like that just makes people more stressed out and that's just not, you know, not helpful. Like my, with my son, he's 17 and he's asking me for this or that. I'm like, okay, well you're 17. I'm, you know, there's only so many things he's going to implement. And, uh, so yeah. yeah, I tell him he's in a natural steroid cycle, so hit the gym. <laughs> exactly. It's like, just, just if we would just work on your sleep, you know, and stuff. Anyway, we're going to start going to the gym together at 4.30 in the morning. I'm so excited. Anyway, Dave, what about you? Well, I was going to say the only advice I'd give people is just go, you know, go get a test, right? Get a blood test. See where you're at. Because, you know, otherwise you're just guessing. And don't mm. do don't do exactly what I'm doing because the things I'm doing, I'm trying to do specifically to address holes or issues in my tests that reveal something that I need to do, you know, work on. Guy once uh, on Instagram sent me a photo of like his kitchen countertop with all these supplements on it. And it, at first, at first glance, I thought it, it was a picture of like my kitchen because this was like all the supplements I take right to the brand. And it turned mm -hmm. out he bought everything that he saw on my website. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, oh my God, I was horrified. I said, what do you do? I see DHEA, I see pregnenolone on here. Why oh, are you taking those? You don't need, you probably don't need those at your age because he was a young guy. I said, I'm taking those specifically because my levels were low. You don't need those. So he was getting ready to go see his doctor. And I said, you know, please discuss this with your doctor. Ask him for some, you know, some tests. If he won't run them, then, you know, go to Life Extension, go to, you know, Ulta Labs, go to any of these at home lab companies and go, go pay for your own test and find out what you need and address that. But other than that, I just tell people don't, don't just copy and do what I do because, you know, I'm still learning myself. So I still could be making mistakes. You don't want to just copy my mistakes. If they are mistakes, just go find out what's right for you. Let's talk about big picture longevity as a sport. So this is quite a uh, development that that wasn't really talked about uh, a couple of years ago, right? Like longevity as a sport, what the heck? We are doing mouse studies and, and figuring out that way and randomized control trials, not, not sport. How would that even work? Do you guys have some, some insights on why or is it even longevity as a sport? A good idea <laughs> well yeah like every professional sport is like bad for you almost <laughs> or tends to be uh, harmful to your health at some point um so I, I don't think it's it's probably not you know even physically the healthiest not to mention like for your mental health to try to yeah like turn longevity into, into some sort of a sport and uh even then you're like you're using a metric that has very big flaws and shortcomings to assess that so then you might you might be doing some random thing which is you know the kind of the test score without even knowing if it's actually going to be good for your longevity <laughs> so it's, it's not it's, it's not really like you know a healthy thing eventually probably yes yeah. health the ultimate goal i mean if you're you know talking about longevity then 
I guess th- it needs to have have a certain component of health. Like aging is pretty much the kind of deterioration of health over time. So uh, maintaining like the health for longer, that's kind of just the definition of uh, longevity in my, in my eyes. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, vitality. It's, I, I, it is sort of odd. I mean, I love that it's brought a lot of attention to the topic. And I think that that's what um, I say that the only, not the only, but, you know, one of the main positives to having this be a quote unquote sport. sport. I mean, I'm not sure I can think of it as a sport as much as just a way to compare results and people to like learn from each other, you know, like Dave is able to do whatever, like say you do these age bot sessions and those are the things that now slow down your pace of aging by 10%. Well, that's something worth trying. You know, I mean, I know, but I mean, let's just say, that, you know, there's something where a person's protocol slows their pace of aging down considerably, then that might be something another person might want to try. So in that sense, I think it's um, really helpful to com- quote unquote compare results, but I don't see it as if we're all kind of running races against each other. I think we're all, I, I would think competing with ourselves. I, I, I mean, that's the way I take it. I'm always just like, I just, it's the way I've always I've never, I mean, I've swam for, I don't know, what, 10 years or something. I don't think I ever actually competed against another person. It was always, my mindset was always like, I want to get a better time in this. I want to, you know, make myself better. Um, And then as a byproduct, you know, you're, you finish, finish well or or whatever. Yeah. The way I look at the the longevity numbers in this, this whole competition, it's, it's just one measure, but it's not the entire picture. Because you can you can live a really long life, and then still end up going blind or losing your hearing, or have hardening of the arteries. So you might have very slow pace of aging, but you might not be at an at an organ level. You might not be optimal, and so you could you could end up being sick for a very long time. And that's what I'm not I, I'm not into. I don't want to be sick for a very long time. So I want my health span to equal my lifespan, if that makes sense. And speaking of the HBOT, you know, I did try the the HBOT and the plasmapheresis and tested after a session of a long duration of those to see if it made any difference at all to my pace of aging. No. Um, didn't yeah, move fine. I wouldn't think it would. I wouldn't think it would. But, but I just know, use as an example, you know, it's like yeah. We all do different things that we're all trying. I mean, I don't vary my protocol too much, but you know, if I add something, it'd be interesting to see what happens. So, but I do those things for rejuvenation more than longevity. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. One could argue that the sport of longevity is the only, the one exception of a sport being bad for your health because that's the objective of a longevity sport to improve your health what do you think about that yeah i guess you know yeah if the goal is to be healthy then uh, technically if you're taking the sport too far and it becomes unhealthy then you should yeah like course correct automatically in some sense but uh yeah it's hard to say it's just very it's very innate in human psychology to like try to do more, and um, yeah, in the in a competition, in a comp- competitive space, especially or a frame, you're yeah like trying to do more, and that usually ends up backfiring somehow. <laughs> so you're like, okay, I'm gonna do more exercise or something, and then your uh, results go worse, or I'm gonna you know take this supplement and then your results go worse. So it's almost like no matter what your result is with this sport, it's never enough. <laughs> you're always going to be, okay, I got this score. It might be your best score yet, but then you're like, okay, how do I get it even better? And that makes you want to, okay, tinker with your protocol somehow. And uh, that in, 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 in a lot of cases will just make it worse. <laughs> so you don't know if, if uh, what you have right now is the best like uh, routine uh, because you're always thinking that okay, there's a, the, like the grass is always greener on the other side, <laughs> so I'm gonna try to like mess it up 
with a with a, the protocol not deliberately but because you're trying to get better results and it's, it's so engraved in the psyche i guess of the competition in the spirit of competition that you you'll always want to improve it you'll always want to do something because it's a competition even if you're number one you're like okay i'm gonna try to still get even better <laughs> results and then you know you might get worse results because of that yeah it is kind of figuring out which things are that u-shaped curve right you know it's like 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 running is good for you but mm, if you start running like all day every day maybe not so much you know same thing power lifters like weightlifting is good for you but you know at the end of your life and you've been power lifting your whole life maybe maybe not in the best of shape so you know it's figuring out which one of those things you know more is definitely not always better and figuring out that sweet spot is very person dependent on certain things so i mean we're all just kind of sorting it out as we go i think yeah. mike Luska and i were talking about that last night actually and uh yeah because we both like to experiment with moving different markers and sometimes you move one marker and it can affect a whole bunch of other ones in a negative direction so at least a th thing that we both try to do is measure often so that we can course correct early yeah i guess yeah the most important thing is to, to compete with yourself <laughs> somehow i think that's the healthiest approach because yeah then then you're like you'll be more like easier on yourself as well i guess if you're just competing with yourself it just seemed to me that you guys are on the right track here that competition changes the game because now i want to i want to beat dave right to get more street cred and in order to do that i'm going to do stem cell therapy inside a hyperbaric chamber and even though it might there is a chance that it might make it worse. I'm going to take that risk because I need that street cred. But that's the that's the beauty of the thing because if it works, then the world learns. And yeah, I, I want you guys to do exosome therapy and whatnot. It's a, that's how we learn. That's how we mm. learn. I do a lot of my testing after negative life events because I want to see how those impacted me. You know, after the 30 days in Italy of eating a completely different diet than I normally eat, that was that was pretty eye opening for me. And I tested after um, having been sick most of, like second half of December, like all of January, most of February. I wanted to see how that would impact my pace of aging and epi epigenetic age, and it did. I, I gave those numbers all to Mike, so he's going to talk about those in a future YouTube. But um, <laughs> yeah, I I like to see the things that are going to impact me and learn from those. I went through a, a self-imposed stressful stent here the past couple months, and I saw my pace of aging just tank. My telomeres actually got shorter. So now I know I have to really focus back more on recovery and, and getting my, my mindset correct so that I'm taking the pressure off of myself and not just running myself ragged. So there's a big mental portion of this that goes with it. Yeah. Yeah, from having some changes to my my hormone replacement therapy and so I've been reluctant to test because I'm like oh we're still figuring it out and I don't really want to do a pace of aging test in the middle of this because it's just been a pretty sleepless summer so <laughs> I don't think I've slept since I don't know maybe like April or May like I mean I've sleep but not like I was before it's just like getting up two three times a night I'm like well I'm not going to test my pace, pace of aging now because I know it's going to be horrible so um, so anyway, yeah. It does seem like a recurring theme that the competition athletes are holding back on their usual schedule of, of what they would normally do on when to measure their pace of aging because they want to get a, get a better better place, right? So <laughs> you're not going to do it when it's so low. And that might actually foreshadow some, some ways to improve the rejuvenation Olympics, right? Maybe... Maybe it would be better to to actually always the low always your lowest pace could be the one that ranks you right. Mm -hmm. uh, then that you would wouldn't nice. have to like try to figure out when you get the best one. Right. But yeah. It, I mean, for me, I'm not so much concerned about that as much as like I really I don't have the budget to test again and again and again. So it's like, well, I'm not going to test this when I know it's not going to be good. So it's not so much because of the rejuvenation Olympics. It's just, 
I know that. So it's like, I'd rather wait until we have everything kind of, cause we're in the middle of changing it all and it's not set yet. So it's like, once it's set, then I can see like, okay, is this new, I don't know, protocol for hormone replacement therapy, is that, you know, better or worse than what I had, but I just want it set and I want to be sleeping and, um, cause I just, I mean, it's like, I wanted 220 a test. So it's just, that's just not for like, yeah, I got a kid going to college, so <laughs> that is not something I can just do a, multiple times a year. I know I can do it like once a year, so I'm just going to wait a little bit until things settle down. So I, I think what could work is that um, the rejuvenation Olympics or a longevity competition, the immortal combat, could restart every year and always your lowest test could be the one that that counts. Right, so if you are Peter Diamond, this or Brian Johnson, then you do a test every single day, and then um, your lowest test is going to be the best. But if you're Julie Gibson, then you only do one test a year when you think it's going to be the best, and then you could still compete with Brian Johnson. Because what do we have right now? Uh, you have to have. Do you guys? completely understand the current rules? Is there someone in this call who completely understand the current rules? I think it's three tests within two years. And so to be on the uh, the verified leaderboard, but you can still be on the board like me. So that's why I've fallen way off because I don't, I'm only testing once a year, um, at least right now. Um, so it'd be the yeah. average of your three best. Yeah, and it's the average of your three best. Are they only are they taking the that's the only thing I don't understand? Are they taking the average of your your last three tests, or are they taking the average of all your tests? Of all of your tests within the three years, the three best, three or two, three, I believe. I thought it was twenty four months. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm I misunderstood what you're asking me. The three best tests within the two years. Yes, twenty four months. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Another thing that changed with the new update of the Rejuvenation Olympics is that Simland got to the top of it. <laughs> well deserved. It was about time. Because you were, you were at the top of that for like many, many, many months before you actually got listed. So yeah. it's good to finally it see. Long, it took him a long time to make those changes, huh? I'd like to argue yeah. against it. <laughs> you you know, because... I'd like to argue against it because, so what we had before is an absolute leaderboard where your rejuvenation, your, your score, your rank would be weighed by your age, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a Dunedin pace of 0 0.7 and you're 100 years old, then you're going to rank better than a mm -hmm. 0 0.6 and a 30 year old, right? So... Yeah. That changed, and now young people, I mean, it is good to see who has really low rejuvenation Dunedin pace. But on the other hand, the people who are really old and get good Dunedin pace, they are really interesting, right? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I feel like uh, I wish they would at the very least, if they're not going to wait for their chronological age, I wish they would at the very least list it because I'm just not as interested in a... 17 year old with a 50 percent pace of aging versus like you said a 100 year old with a 70 percent like that i want to know what that 100 year old is doing i'm not so concerned about the the teenager so mm -hmm. i think it it's more useful information it, it's okay if they don't want to wait by chronological age it's their game but i think it makes the whole the information more robust yeah, previously there was a 15-year-old that held the third place spot for almost a year. I just thought, no. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's hard to, because I don't know even how do they make those calculations. So it's their own some sort of formula. So I don't because there's no like, you know, gold standard method to <laughs> measure this. So they're coming up with a formula by themselves anyway, or these adjustments for the the age and stuff. So it's you know, hard to say, okay, which method is, you know, more accurate or which test is more accurate so that, yeah, I, I wouldn't like make any like 
broad conclusions from this test because like they said earlier like if you have good score with this test but you have some other like disease or something then you know you're still worse off <laughs> than the one who has slightly worse of this uh, biological age score but no no of this uh, comorbidities or something like that so i think the outcomes are you know more important still like uh like longevity isn't about so like let's actual actual longevity actually living longer isn't about this uh low score with this test it's mm -hmm. you know actually actually living to 100 and uh, the way you do that is mostly not having comorbidities <laughs> not getting uh, chronic diseases like heart disease and uh, diabetes and uh, kidney disease so those are the, like more functional outcomes that actually matter or they're the ones that actually have been proven to result in longevity whereas with this test it's i guess it's very like experimental in that sense it would be nice if they they have like a combination of tests like something that would capture so i mean i know they have this whole organ age thing that's coming up but it would be and i don't know what it would be you know like dave and i were talking about like oh maybe they add vo2 max it's like well then you know all the athletes would rank high or you know but it would just be interesting if there was a way to come up with a combination of tests and you know because um, mm. it is it is curious to see how certain people age and what's possible i mean i think it shows people what's possible um and redefines you know aging stereotypes i suppose i mean if, so mm. it is nice to see but it's, it would be a i don't i don't you know i'm not medically astute enough to even figure out what those combination of tests would be but i think you know the whole competition would be more um credible if they came up with you know at least three different three different measurements you know yeah and mm -hmm. it's hard to say too like how much of it is being driven by genetics and how much of it is you know the actual lifestyle changes that you've made so to brian's credit i think at one point when he originally tested he his pace of aging was above one. So to be able to move the needle that far from above one to something so low is, I mean, it tells you right there that his low score is not just from genetics. It's really from the things that he's changing. So mm -hmm. I think that's even more interesting to see when people start off with a high score and bring it down. Because just like I said, it just eliminates that whole, oh, that's it's only genetics kind of argument that people like to toss out. Okay. There is the Dunedin pace, which is a pace of aging, but which is probably the best biological aging clock. I, I think that's fair to say, although I am pretty much in the in the marketing, in my mind, pretty much all the marketing information of true diagnostics. So yeah. I do believe that's the best, but I acknowledge my bias on this. But uh, from a concept shop point of view, for a longevity competition, it would be better to actually have a aging clock that is telling you a biological age rather than a pace of aging. What's the best aging clock? What do you guys think? I don't think we have one yet, but anyone would agree. At least that's my understanding that there's not one out there yet that any, you know, a majority of people say, oh, this is the best one. So I don't know. My understanding is they're all using the same base assays and it's just their interpretations that make them vary. And it's the algorithms that they run on the results that, uh, that differentiate them. Look at like some of the studies and the Horvath 2 clock uh, appears to be one of the best ones. And the Fino age is also pretty good. And uh, the Dunedin pace, it's not very good for biological age, but it's good for all cause mortality risk. So um, a lower score on a donut and pace would, or in, in a few of studies, they do find that it like correlates with a lower risk of uh, mortality, but it's not like the best for the biological age perspective. And then you might think, okay, which one is more important? Is it better to have a lower biological age or is it better to have a lower risk of uh, mortality? Uh, and and the, the problem is, yeah, like uh, we don't know if a lower biological age would reduce the risk of mortality, so to say. Like uh, you could still have heart disease with a low biological age. And, uh, you know, I think uh, it's important to yeah, like 
I guess yet you have a lot more like research about about these things before making any like yeah conclusions which one is the best or something like that. I was just reading a white paper the other day that was comparing like the Horvath clock to uh, Pheno Age and um, and and the other, and each one of them had their strengths and mm. each had their weaknesses. So you almost need to combine them all together to be able to get a, a total picture. So I do try to do that, like test with all of them. And of course, you know, they, they, they don't always agree, but it's interesting. Yeah, and you definitely need to look at all the biomarkers or the blood markers as well, the traditional ones like, you know, lipids and inflammation and immune cells and uh, the kidney function and liver function, etc. So the, the biological age tests are, I always think of them like, yeah, it, it's kind of interesting and nice to have but I would never like start with it. <laughs> like I would, uh, I would just yeah to do a comprehensive blood panel and uh, start with that because uh, you know the information, so like so the practical information you get from that is way more actionable. So like you know when I got my these do not pace results, so like my my routine really didn't change between the tests because you know I was already doing the same things pretty much and. Uh, so yeah, like you get the test result, so you don't really know what you need to do <laughs> with this single number. Whereas if you do a blood panel, you can see, okay, your you know kidney function is suboptimal or your liver enzymes are too high. You can do more specific action steps to improve those results. Whereas with this, you know, you get 0 0.7 or whatever. So like, okay, now what? You probably will still do the same things that you did, that we know is like, you know, okay, don't eat too much exercise, get more sleep and and uh, etc so like the practical takeaway from this dunedium paste test is like not very like big so and especially like the more advanced you are with health or you know you're already doing exercise three four times a week you're already eating a very good diet you're sleeping enough you're taking a bunch of supplements and you get this test result so okay now what i'm already putting like so much effort in so i don't know <laughs> what do i need to do to get the, the better do not pace score. Whereas with a blood panel, you can see, okay, aha, you know, my immune cells are a bit off and there's a specific things you can do to improve those results based on a ton of other studies. And, uh, or, you know, your lipids are too high. You know exactly what you need to do pretty much. And uh, your uh, CRP is high. You, you have you know, like so many studies that actually show how to reduce CRP. Uh, whereas with, you know, the the do need and paste test it's uh you're like okay what do i do now <laughs> what about systems age slash symphony age that makes things actionable wouldn't it assuming it works potentially maybe yeah we'll we'll see i haven't paid for my so i haven't seen like my full results yet have you guys done yours symphony age which one symphony mm -hmm. age no? that was they they had it on there in the first day or something when they updated yeah. it but uh, it was uh, removed then. <laughs> Adam has those numbers, right? He, he screen captured the... <laughs> well, I was going to say. Thank you. Yeah. I haven't taken that test yet, but cool. Eventually. For the record, Dave, you have seen your full results. Um, the rest is just, I don't know, some generic generated text nothing oh, special I, I just focused on the worst of them that you you forewarned me about so i didn't really look at the rest <laughs> what about what about the old school biological aging clock the telomeres uh, are they still relevant if yes how much i don't think they're the be all the end all but i, I think they're at least a a clue i think they're yeah, part they're of a signpost yeah i agree sorry dave i didn't mean to cut you off no, but no, yeah it's just that i agree so. So your team probably had more insight into that than I do because you know the science better. But yeah, yeah, take it away, Seam. <laughs> <laughs> the well, the, the shortening so acceler the telomere acceleration is like more relevant to mortality risk, uh, whereas the total length is kind of not that important. And um, in some cases, like you know, excess telomere growth uh, is also like characteristic to um, uh, cancer cells as well so it's kind of hard to know okay or at least right now we don't know like okay what's the optimal length and how do you optimally increase them and uh, etc so it is interesting for sure and you know at least i've seen 
some cases of uh, this uh, telomere changing. So like I did the first to need and paste test and uh, it also gave you the telomere length and uh, it showed that, you know, I had very long telomeres for my age. So I guess my telomere age, which they gave the number was like four, <laughs> four years old. But then I did the two, <laughs> I did the two following tests as well. But I did them after I had COVID and that, that accelerated the attrition of the telomeres. So my telomere age was like 30 and 33. So that like literally three decades after COVID, uh, it accelerated my telomere age uh, from, from that. But, and I didn't even have like a very serious COVID. I was like with the fever a few days. But uh, yeah, it's like the test is very sensitive to like those kind of things. And it, at least it showed as well, like the telomeres, they can, uh, you know, experience uh, shortening when you are experiencing some sort of like, you know, stress or um, illness or infection. Now, I did do the test as well a few weeks ago and I should get my results. You know, the, the email said that it's tomorrow where I'll get the results, but we'll see. And, you know, it's been a year since I had COVID, since I do, did the test. So it would be interesting to see, okay, what's what's my telomeres right now and what's my... the do need in pace as well after after one year from uh, the COVID. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I'm curious. I haven't thought about that. I had COVID this yeah. summer, so sorry. Go ahead, Dave. No, I'm just, I was just saying, I'm curious to see how quickly it snaps back because I just got my latest test results back and my telomeres were the length of a 72-year-old now. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. What was it What was it before? Um, so... Back in like 2012, it was of a 68-year-old when I was 50, and that shocked me. And so I oh, went yeah. from all the way down to about a 52-year-old. So now the fact that it says it's like 77, 78-year-old is like, or mm. like 72. It, yeah. Shocking. It might so also be very fluid. Back. So. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. And I'm, so I'm very curious to see when I retest how quickly or how not quickly <laughs> that comes back. Yeah. So you need the teach both sessions, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't even know if those will have any effect, but it would be curious I to see. Were, I thought they were supposed to on telomeres. I could They're be wrong. To. I mean, there was some very good marketing about some Israeli research. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. marketing. I mean, there's all maybe, kinds of maybe. stuff about a lot of things, and so that's why I test because a lot of things are supposed to do stuff, and then for me, they don't do anything at all. So, <laughs> but they might for some people. You never know, but. For me now so i don't know we'll see okay so i want to bring you two dilemmas i have or thought exercises let's say so firstly i am sad because while i was doing bitcoin development every year i sent him one question to our longevity subreddit how long can scientists keep a mouse alive in a laboratory and why I'm sad is because the answer have not changed for the last four to five years, like 30%, maybe 40, maybe 50, but it's nothing impressive. So if we can't even make a mouse live like impressively long enough, then what, what, what hope there is? for us humans. Yeah, I think the, the longest is the 65% with calorie restriction. And that was the, one of the first studies in the field back in, yeah, like the 60s even, or 70s or 80s, I'm not sure exactly, but yes, yeah, it's, it's been like, yeah, 40 or 50 years since <laughs> the record was uh, set to one of the longest life extensions in uh, mice. But uh, yeah, I mean, you can make it, you can make the argument like both ways you could, you know, uh, make it that, you know, it's, it's going to happen any moment and it's going to be exponential, which is the longevity escape velocity argument that, you know, in 2030 or something, that's where the magic happens with life extension because of some breakthroughs in AI and stuff like that. Uh, or you could make the argument that, yeah, this is, this is pretty much it. There's, there's going to be, yeah, like a small increase in life expectancy, like a few years because of just better healthcare and the things of that. So you'll, you know, live maybe like a few, 10 years longer or something like that. But, you know, I think in either case, the best thing to do is to just, yeah, still 
or depends on your goals, you know, like if you don't want to spend a lot of time and uh, effort trying to be healthy, then you can just live a, like a regular life and not really worry about it and see how long it will take you. <laughs> uh, or the other option is if you enjoy this, like, you know, I think we all here, here enjoy being healthy and enjoy exercise and and uh, eating healthy foods, etc. So we get more enjoyment out of that as opposed to whatever the alternative is of being careless with your health. So either it's in either case is like win-win for us at least. And if you're like a health conscious person who just enjoys these things, then it's a win-win scenario for you anyway. So because, you know, if there is, is no breakthrough and that's it, this is the longest we'll ever live, then you'll still have a longer health span. Your, your quality of life is better and, you know, you're enjoying the time as well. And the other version is that, you know, if we do actually have this breakthrough, then you're the, then who's laughing then? <laughs> so, so like uh, in both cases, it's a uh, win-win for us, I think. Yeah, What's I the launch of ETS Keep Velocity? Uh, yeah, it's like this idea that uh, with every year that goes, pa goes by, like the advancements in science and technology will keep you alive for longer than a year. So your life expectancy increases more than one year with every year that it goes by. So like, you know, one year goes by, but your life expectancy goes up by two years ad infinitum. So you're like just continuously being kept alive with some sort of uh, breakthrough in science. And when is it expected to happen? I mean, 20, 30, right? Ray Kurzweil, who's the guy, one of the, one of the like pioneers in this field, he says it's like 2030, or he uses the single narrative where humanity emerges with AI, but it's very, like they use it interchangeably, almost like this uh, singularity and uh, longevity escape velocity. Uh, Aubrey de Grey, who's the, who coined the term, I think he says it's like 2045, 2040 or something like that. So yeah, it depends uh, which person you ask. We have a problem there because what I noticed, what I realized is that people don't really care about the longevity escape velocity. So there was a post of Brian Johnson when he posted a picture of his green veggie thingy and it's the breakfast of champions and that green veggie mush together thingy looked like that came out of some, I don't know, vegetarian animals or something. So many people have realized or commented that well, say one thing that's worse than death, you know. <laughs> uh, so, so, but why? Well, this longevity escape velocity concept is nice and all, but the real thing is the hedonism escape velocity, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. fair enough. I, I find it a bit, uh, I don't want to say egotistical to think that you're going to live forever because I do think that we will eventually figure out how to do that and, but i i think as humanity each one of us will have to come to the choice to whether we want to live forever you know do we want to just keep the party going because at some point maybe the party's over and you're just like mm, maybe not so much you know i i don't you know who knows what the future will hold i i think we could all bet that eventually we will figure out enough science that we could live if not forever such long lives that it will feel like forever <laughs> i mean life you know under the best of circumstances life could be still very very stressful and how many i mean i certainly know in my life i've faced many periods of significant hardship and stress and you know emotional hurts and so how many i mean i i just have to project forward that if i go to live another 200 years then i would have X amount more of those. I mean, hopefully be wiser to get through them, but um, it'll be interesting to see like what kind of choice we'll be faced with, you know, whether, whether that could happen or not. Mm. Should suicide be legal? Oh, I think I like, to... I think yeah, I, like, I like the idea of, you know, being uh, immortal by default but then uh, you can choose if you want to die like because right now there's no choice <laughs> you like everyone has no choice they will die uh which is you know kind of unfair from uh like ethical perspective in that sense uh but if you have the choice of okay you if you want to die then you can die but you also have the option to just, like you know 
you stay alive uh, i think that kind of i think that would be like the goal of i think if humanity would reach immortality then it's also humane to allow uh, death for people who like want it it'd be interesting how that would shift because like i think a lot of us i know i mean for my my own personal experience again after my brother died it was like the the lust for life the uh, pleasure and enjoyment that i had for life like increased immeasurably and so knowing that literally any day it could be over um you know that whole seize the day kind of thing so if if this were switched around so that we knew we were going to live forever but you get to choose like i wonder how that would change our our appreciation of life like would it flip it to a positive i i don't know i mean it's an interesting thing to think about I don't want to be the Bitcoiner who ruins this conversation, <laughs> <laughs> but but in Bitcoin there is this concept. Well, not in Bitcoin in economics, but in Bitcoin we talk a lot about this concept of high and low time preference. So when you're living in your little fiat worlds like you three guys, uh, you are trying to spend your money as fast as possible because the, they are going to inflate their value away. But if you're living in Bitcoin standard, so you opted out of the existing political system, then now you have like an appreciating asset in terms of Bitcoin. So your time preference changes because now you are planning for much further down the road and not just trying to to figure out how to, what to spend this thing before they inflate it away from me, right? So, so very similar thing to time, right? If you have a lot more time, then your time preference changes on what you're spending and what you're planning. It's suddenly not retirement and dying anymore. It's, as well, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a hundredth career, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, with it, one one argument is, yeah, like, without death, you wouldn't have urgency to do, like, things, uh, to start projects or something like that. But at the same time, if you have, like, infinite amount of time, then you'll start, like, you'll have the time to start them all as well. <laughs> so to say, mm -hmm. like, uh, so, like, yeah, if, if, if your life is finite, you know you're going to die, then there's always this... Uh, push and pull between like okay am i living my life to the fullest should i like go out and party or should i go travel more should i do spend more time with my friends and family or something of like that because you know like okay if i work all the time then uh, i might regret it in the future because of uh you know having wasted quote unquote by society standards uh, by being too healthy all the time <laughs> um, but but at the same time if you have like infinite amount of time then you wouldn't feel that either because you know you'll have infinite amount of time to travel and you have infinite am amount of time to do everything you'll have the infinite amount of time to work on all the projects to learn all the instruments or some, something like that and mm -hmm. it's never even even then you'll never have experienced everything so uh yeah like it wouldn't like remove the kind of i guess the f finiteness of uh life in, in that sense because you'll be able to do like everything if that makes sense. What would be interesting too is like, I mean, we're all talking about we would do a hundred different things over the course of a life. Like what if somebody just decided to go deep, you know, and long, and then you had that continuation of wisdom, you know, so much, like, I feel like sometimes we rehash, like, I don't know, maybe you're reading Seneca or you're reading some old philosopher and it's like, wait a minute, we already kind of figured that out. Like to a certain degree as a society, sometimes we're maybe reinventing the wheel. So you know, if we have these very long lived people with that continuation of wisdom, like would it change how we how we grow as a society, how we exist as a society or or any one field? I mean, just the field of longevity, if you had, say, Aubrey de Grey or, you know, some other scientist that now like they're going to be able to devote 400 years to that, like not that he'd want to. But I'm just saying, you know, it'd be interesting that you wouldn't lose that that wisdom that would, you know, eventually die off, that you'd kind of be able to continue, you know, that person be like, oh no, we did that 200 years ago. We already looked at that and here, go here for these results or, you know, that type of stuff. Be interesting. Yeah. I think it depends a lot too on whether you have a, you know, a growth mindset 
or not. Because I'm, I'm convinced that there's some people that if they could live forever, they would just go on partying forever. They wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't spend any of that time learning and growing and expanding themselves. I don't know. I think, I think eventually people, everybody wants to, maybe that's just my bias, but I think well, they'll eventually yeah. the part, yeah, I was going to say like, I would have a season of like, just travel, travel, travel. And then I'd have a season of like, Oh, I really am into this and I want to do this. And those seasons, instead of being a year or a decade, they'd be, you know, several decades long. It'd be really cool. Well, I think we'll figure it out with uh, like some other animals first, like mice and well, not completely, but, you know, we'll be able to, like, extend uh, animal lifespan by, you know, X percent uh, way, way before than uh, humans. So we'll be able to, like, learn from that. Has anybody ever tested doing um, calorie restriction and rapamycin together on mice? Do you know that, like, in combination? I don't know. Um, not that I remember, but, but uh, yeah, rapamycin has, like, almost equal effects in uh, life extension. Yeah, I was curious to know if it would, you know, I doubt it'd be additive, but would it increase one or the other? That's is... actually one of the points, uh, one of the things that people bring up against my mice dilemma that, hey, we are testing mice, but we are only testing always one specific things. But here we have Dave Pasco who's doing a hundred different things and we are not testing a hundred different things on mice. So that might be the reason why we are expected to live longer than the mice itself. Well, according to ancestry, I have mouse lineage in my DNA. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm pro mouse studies. So. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, let's talk about how do you guys move? What's always interesting is is the differences in between people. So you are all high level competitors. So one of you pitches their way of how they are moving, exercising day to day. And then the next one is going to give his own protocols, but in a way where he highlights the differences of the previous one. Boy, okay. Carol bike, P90X, running. Those are the primaries. I like to do uh, yoga and Pilates at, uh, at various times. Okay, so what's the difference between carol bike and running? Are they both cardio? Yeah, yeah. Uh, carol bike would be re-hit. So it's, you know, it's those two 20-second all-out sprints. I could do sprints outside when I run, but it's, uh, it's a lot more convenient to do it on the carol bike. Your P90X, how much is it resistance training or what, what kind of training is that? All kinds of training? Yeah, it's a mix. It's a 14-day program with something different each of those days. So there's weight-bearing exercises, say like, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then there would be cardio exercises Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and then recovery exercises on Sunday. So it's, it's constantly mixing everything up. So you're, you're hitting all muscle groups. You're like just terribly sore in the beginning everywhere. All right. So, yeah. I mean, it, it is in the beginning. Yeah. That's why they call it extreme, right? That's the X is for extreme. But, you know, if you can make it through the first two weeks, I always tell everybody, you know, because most people quit. They quit in the first two weeks because it's just too much. You don't have to kill yourself in the first two weeks. You can do the same routines, but you can use lighter weights. You know, you don't have to pick up the heaviest things you can find right off the bat. But if you make, make it past the first two weeks, that soreness goes away. Your muscles adapt and um, you feel pretty, pretty good about it. And then you find that you can start adding more weight or add more reps, but it's totally up to you. Julie, how's your exercise routines compared to Dave's miserable protocols? <laughs> Mine's in flux right now. I've, I had like a pretty set routine and now I'm like, switching it around to actually lifting heavy like a lot heavier stuff i was only doing like two days full body resistance training but now i'm doing i think i'm gonna split it up to three or four days again kind of go back and forth but and i'm really upped how much i lift and i was doing like three sets of 12 that you know whatever weight i could get through all those three sets and now i'm like you know what i'm dialing the 
sets down to or the reps down to like five and doing like five reps and increasing the weight um, just based on new information I'm learning. And so I'm doing that. I'm adding plyometrics at least one day a week. I was doing mobility training um, last night. And um, then, of course, cardio, you know, the VO2 max. And I'm going to try to add another hit or something like that. Um, like I said, I'm trying to start running again. Um, I, I, would, I went in for a VO2 max test and it, unbeknownst to me, it was actually a day before I officially developed COVID too. So I didn't get a very good score on the test and I was very, like it was only like one point lower than what I had, but I was expecting to get higher and it was on the treadmill and it just pissed me off that I didn't get a good score. <laughs> so I really, I was like, this isn't, so I was like, I need to like learn how to run again. Cause it, like, it kind of made me out of breath. And I was like, okay, I don't like that feeling at all. I don't like um, so I'm adding running back. Hopefully my hip will um, cooperate. And if it doesn't, I'm definitely looking into exosomes and stem cells. So, um, but I'm still doing like the other cardio machines as well and trying to get outside. And I like to do, it's funny, kind of like you, Dave, like I don't like to go out and do my sprints outside. I was thinking, oh, I could like go sprint on this grass field or whatever, but somehow I feel like I can push myself harder on a treadmill where I can like see, you know, like, Oh, just, just one more point, one more point, one more point, you know, um, that feels more ambitious to me than just trying to go as fast as I can and timing myself. I don't know. I can do sprints pretty well in the pool too. Um, but yeah, it's just from my training. I'm just kind of, I'm just so sick of the pool. I can't, I just can't do it. <laughs> At least on the treadmill, you can keep all things equal. You know, you don't have to worry yeah. about the weather being a variable or, you know, bugs flying in your mouth or your, your eyes while you're running is another app. Yeah. 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 Or 114 degrees. Exactly. <laughs> what is that over there? Like 40 something. And I don't, I don't even know. Like it's something crazy. Long story short, I'm doing the cardio, I'm doing resistance, but I'm trying to add this plyometrics and, and adding mobility training. So, um, and then I, I do like yoga, that kind of stuff. I just kind of naturally do every night. I stretch before bed and it's usually some sort of little yoga poses and stuff like that. And every once in a while I'll do hot yoga in my garage. Cause it's again, 114 degrees. So <laughs> imagine seeing before we get onto you, could you explain your understanding of uh, Julie's and Dave's protocols? Well, Dave does, I guess, more like functional training, like P90X and running and the kind of hit intervals and uh, Julie tries to do yeah like similar things but she's uh yeah focusing a bit more on uh, strength right now and yoga and balance as well as uh try to work on uh vr 2 max and uh, cardio all right so was that close enough guys yeah you did you didn't know you were going to test it did you yeah right and i i didn't say it but strength is definitely my priority vo2 max is second although after that score i'm going to kind of they do a little better so and how's your protocols are similar or different to theirs i think uh everyone would want to do both you know strength and cardio so i think we're like on the same page with that so that doing some form of resistance training and cardiovascular exercise uh, you know that's the most beneficial way to go about it i have like yeah very similar like that i do weightlifting or calisthenics a few times a week and then I'll do cardio as well a few times a week so yeah I think it's quite uh, quite similar okay let's move on to sleep and let's do the exact same thing but without my annoying interruptions you go Dave you start oh geez my sleep could be a whole lot better my sleep is all over the place especially now that I've been retired only because I'm not forced into the uh the nine to five routine and having to be up at a specific time to do something. So now if you know I want to go out to a concert with friends and stay out a little later, eh, I could do that. But my sleep scores have been all over the place. So I, it's, it's one thing I need to get back and get serious and start focusing a little more on getting a more set routine. And my scores aren't terrible, but they, they, they could be better just because I have no consistency. Okay, well, so I'm probably different than both of the other guys. I don't 
track my sleep. I don't have an aura ring or any of that kind of stuff. I just know if I wake up and ooh, that. And then lately it's just been like, oh, waking up two or three times a night, like I said, because they're changing my hormone replacement therapy. So it's not been very good right now, for sure. Um, um, I mean, I think I, I think I went through years of like really great sleep. And so now I just try to make sure everything that I can control is, you know, I'm, I'm in bed by, I'm actually in bed by 8.30, you know, lights out by nine, the alarm's not set till like five five thirty depending on the day so that i i'm sure that and i usually wake up before my alarm but i just you know set it so that i know just in case um but unfortunately i'm waking up and not so much hot flashes but just yeah it's just not been good <laughs> but i've got you know like i make sure i don't eat three hours before bed i take a walk after dinner you know, certainly no sugar, no alcohol, because all of those things impact my sleep. And I make sure that I'm meditating every day. All the things that I know um, in the past have, have impacted my sleep. And I know that from other people, you know, other information out there, I just make sure that those things are dialed in, but no aura ring, no whoop, none of, none of that yet. Soon though. When, when you get one, you can join my whoop community because I just started. <laughs> I needed accountability. Okay. And so now I've got like 16 people in my my little whoop, and uh, they're all kicking my butt. It's great. I'm looking at that for my 56th birthday. I'm going to do one or the other, like either a whoop or an aura ring. So pick everybody's brain about that. What about you, Sue? Yeah, I have a uh, pretty like regular sleep schedule. So I'll go to bed usually at 10 p.m. and I'll wake up, you know, 5.30, 6 a.m., something like that. Yeah, I, I don't like deliberately track my sleep, um, at least not right now. I'll add, like um, I don't check it. I guess like I track it uh, quite often, so I have a few different trackers, and I have like the mattress as well, like tracks the sleep. But I don't like check it, <laughs> so it's like I, I don't really care that much about the, the the sleep score. So I'm just yeah, like okay, how do I feel? And uh, sometimes it's good to say okay, see like okay, how's your heart rate or HRV or something like that, and then like make some like adjustments to your recovery or or yeah like if you can uh, detect some sort of a some sort of a cold or something like that you can use the hre for that but yeah, other than that i don't like really go crazy with the sleep tracking in that, in that sense because yeah with sleep it's uh you just need to have like yeah the so solid seven to eight hours and uh make sure you don't have sleep apnea and things like that so uh chances are like your you're getting the right amount of sleep uh, with that already, unless you have a yeah, sleep apnea or an, unless you're, you know, waking up to go to the toilet five times <laughs> per night. Yeah, I also question the, uh, you know, the validity or the accuracy of the data that we get from these devices too, because, you know, like you said, I've got the the eight sleep mattress the same as you. I've got the Aura Ring. I've got you know the Garmin and I've got the Whoop. So I've got four different devices that track my sleep, and they all radically disagree. And they never mm -hmm. say, yeah, they don't tell me I, I completely different amounts of REM, completely different amounts of deep sleep, different awake times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, none of them agree. Is it even like the heart rate variability, variability would that be the same from? Uh, like... my, as far as heartbeat goes, they're all in complete agreement because that's a pretty easy metric. Heart rate variability, the, they yeah. measure a little differently algorith algorithmically. Uh -huh. um, but where they do use the same algorithm, then, then yes, they do. They do pretty much correlate and they do different things with that data, you know, to tell me whether I'm recovered well, or one might say, oh, you know, you didn't recover very well today. You should just kick back and take it easy. And the other ones say, you know, will tell me, oh, you, you're great. You're ready to go. Go have at it today. You know, so it's like, well, what do I do? Right. <laughs> That'd be based on how I feel. I can't speak to can't. Can't depend on the advice I'm getting. Well, now, Dave, you're talking me out of buying one of these things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what I'm trying to say is just pick one. Right. Yeah. Don't don't confuse yourself with a bunch of different ones because you're just going to get different information. Yeah. yeah. May, may I ask some clarification there? So, so what 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 you're saying is that uh, when when we're talking about some metrics like heart rate variability or resting heart rate or some some basic things, then they tend to agree. But when we start talking about some software development invention, 
then then they start to disagree like how <laughs> and it's the same with the epigenetic age clocks right again, again the base assay of how they're getting the data is the same it's the interpretation of the data that varies yeah it's important to have like some sort of baseline yeah and then make like yeah i conclusions from that rather than uh, some like uh, overall number it's more about yeah like what's the baseline for you right now so workout workouts exercises are 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 pretty similar sleeps are like okay you have to sleep well but you can't sleep like champion be a sleep champion but when it comes to nutrition i feel like that's when the rejuvenation olympic athletes are really different in so let's not start with dave this time <laughs> uh, <laughs> tell me a summary of your nutrition and the next one tell the other guy where he what he's doing wrong and why you're doing right <laughs> so who wants to start julie or sim i think sim wants to start <laughs> i think uh the the yeah like diet so like i don't think any particular food is like res solely responsible for like good health or something like that that the food is you know you need food to eat and uh or you need food to like survive and uh what food does is that it can affect like your biomarkers which then ultimately determine whether or not you get diabetes or something else or or you live a long time so it's the biomarkers that are like the more important parts here in my opinion because yeah there's so many different diets out there and you can be healthy on many different diets you know you can you can have optimal blood work on different diets and uh, there are certain foods that tend to improve your blood markers whereas other foods tend to worsen the blood markers so i think that's that's why there's a lot of like confusion online about nutrition and so many conflicting opinions because uh yeah people put too much emphasis on the diet without ne never having measured <laughs> their blood work so you know how do you know that what your diet is good for you if you've never actually measured your blood work like you can't say that just just by virtue of the food because uh, everyone some people might react different to, to different foods so like you know some people say that oh i can't eat a banana it's gonna spike my blood sugar and uh you know makes me feel bad or something like that whereas you know i i never get that and the same with like some allergenic foods like i can eat anything i don't have any like allergies i can eat all the bread and and the lectins and all the legumes and all the nuts and uh, seeds and the all the dairy so i don't have like any food intolerances or anything like that and my blood work is also like great on like almost any kind of diet that i eat um well actually not true like you know if i eat a lot of like fat and uh you know like a low carb keto diet then my you know cholesterol was higher uh, than it is right now whereas at the moment i'm eating more carbs less fat and more like yeah like uh, these uh, fish oil, like omega 3s and those kind of things so my you know blood work is better than it was in the past and that was because i changed my diet and i changed some of the foods and uh i was trying to improve the blood markers so uh theoretically you could be like healthy on any diet but it matters yeah like what kind of uh, blood work you have if that makes sense yeah i I'm, I'm gonna not necessarily point out what's wrong <laughs> but i think uh I agree. Like I would agree because I think that every, not only is every person different in what they need, but also we have different parts of our lives that need different things. And, um, and I think I've spoken this about this, um, in the past, but like I was on a vegan diet and, you know, much like Steve said, like I was having my blood tested at the time and my doctor was just looking at, you know, all these different nutrients and going you're this is not working for you this is you know you you need to switch that so even though i i felt decent on it i was tired um so anyway when i switched all my markers went in the proper direction as well as i felt better and um so i don't think there's any one diet like you know a ketogenic diet might be really really um useful for um, a person at a 
specific point in time, but maybe that's not something they should do the rest of their lives. And maybe for another person, they might need to kind of have a vegan heavy diet. And I'm talking, you know, like maybe it's like two weeks or something like that. Or, um, but I think that it's so specific to the individual and the, where they are in, in life. But my diet just, so like the only things I prioritize are a pound of vegetables and a hundred grams of protein, because that's what I need right now to, you know, get through menopause. I need all that fiber I, as well as I need the greens for you know, all the different wonderful things that it does for you. Um, and then the protein is set like that so that one, I can build muscle and, um, keep that muscle as long as possible. So you know, that's specific to me. I mean, I, with my, like, for instance, again, I'm just going to use my son, 17 years old. I mean, he tries to prioritize protein or this or that, but I think given his metabolism, he has a little bit more room to kind of like, I can't have any sugar, for instance, like if I have sugar, it's like, I will have hot flashes all night long. It's just, it's absolutely horrific. And, um, but like, like he can have ice cream, you know? So every human is a little bit different and where they are at, um, in their lives. Whereas like, you know, like even just 10 years ago, I could have had a very different diet. So I don't know. I, I just, I think it's so individualized. It's hard to speak the praises of any one specifically. Yeah. They like, destroyed them. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was going to happen, right? No, I mean, I, I definitely can't say there's anything wrong with either one of those two approaches. They make complete sense to me. I think for me, I was initially trying to supplement my way out of a bad diet. I used to, you know, I used to eat pretty crappy food, not realizing what effect that had on me. And then when I did figure out the effect that it was having on me, I had no control over it because I had moved back in with my parents around 2001 to take care of them after they both came down with cancer. And at that point, mom was still cooking. So she was in control of the meals. I was not. She was still using vegetable oils for everything, you know, the soybean oil stuff. And, you know, making a lot of the stuff out of the, you know, the hamburger helpers and the, you know, the hot pockets and all the stuff that you can instantly heat up in a microwave. So I was trying to supplement myself, you know, out of the bad diet. But as time progressed, I was able to start focusing on getting more healthy foods into them, especially as they got more and more infirmed and couldn't couldn't get out. So I was the one doing the grocery shopping. So now I started having some control and some influence over what we were eating. And uh, I started feeling better. I think they started feeling better, but they still insisted upon their, their crappy stuff too, because that was their habit, right? Couldn't get them to give up the Hot Pockets or the Kraft American cheese slices and you know all the fake gonna- stuff. I'm going to push back on you, Dave. I don't think it's a habit. I think it's an addiction. I actually think that there's yeah. addictive qualities to those foods that people, you know, crave them. That's, that is true. That's fair. I completely agree yeah. there. Yeah. So after they passed, I started eating healthier but to a point because I was going through a process of where I was remodeling this entire house and I wasn't always able to cook half the time. I didn't have a kitchen or a bathroom, which is a whole nother story. But uh, <laughs> yeah, having to run down the block to use the bathroom every time was not fun. And so when I stopped eating pizza or running to Taco Bell occasionally for a, a quick meal, that's when I noticed my uh, my pace of aging took a huge dip because it was about 0.77, somewhere around there. And when I finally cut out all the other processed crap and started eating just clean, natural food, that's when I got the 0.66 and was able to keep that for quite a while. Interesting. So in my case, it was the things that I removed from my diet that improved my pace of aging, not necessarily the things that I added to it, if that makes sense. So I, I could still learn a ton from Julie because I've seen like some of your Instagram posts where you're preparing your vegetables. And I, I don't really, I, I like to say that I don't really know how to cook I've kind of figured out how to make certain meals that I enjoy, that I like the way they taste and that are easy because I'm super lazy. But I think there's a a ton that I could learn about making good, delicious and nutritious food by watching you. (laughs) I'll have my own little cooking show on Instagram. I I just love food. So like, I, I mean, I, you know, like I've 
I think it was somewhere in, and my mom won't be watching this so I can say this my mom was a horrible cook like horrible <laughs> for one Thanksgiving having this turkey and it was just so dry and I went to a my uh, at that time boyfriend he eventually became my husband but to their to their house for Thanksgiving dinner and eating the turkey being like oh this is what it's supposed to taste like it was so good and so from then on I was like mom I got this I'll, I'm gonna cook and then I just really got into it and I just I absolutely love, love, love being in the kitchen. It's the place I go when I'm stressed. It's the place I go when I'm happy. It's the place, you know, so I feel grateful in that sense because it definitely makes the that component of longevity very not only easy, but it's something I look forward to. And um, I think it's probably a critical play player. I don't think you can do this on pack packaged food. I just don't think that that's possible. I could be wrong, but I just feel like we're meant to, I don't know, live within the environment that grows around us to a certain degree or the plants and the herbs and those things are, are meant for us to be partaking in somehow. All right. Let's build a supplement stock. Let's start from the leanest. Julie, what are you taking? Yeah, not very much. Thank goodness. Um, so I am, let's see, I've got my hormone replacement therapy, which is in the course of changing. Part of that is DHEA and it, there was some pregnenolone in there, but we're taking that out. So I don't take that. And, uh, and like Dave said, don't just cause somebody's listening to this, don't go doing that because you can really mess up your hormones and cause some, you know, I was, I had a fibroid tumor. So don't like, do not mess around with that, those supplements without blood work, um, and the help of a doctor. Um, and then some other, you know, estrogen, progesterone, and um, testosterone. So we're adjusting all those levels. Um, then as far as supplements, I am, what is it? I usually have this all written down, so I apologize. But a B, I do a B complex. I do um, the fish oil. I do um, magnesium, quite a bit of magnesium every day. And I feel like I'm forgetting. Well, I do the Novo supplement, which is a conglomeration of different things. Um what am I forgetting? Oh, vitamin D3, K2. Do that every morning. And oh, I've added um, quercetin this year. So I'm curious to see if that changes anything in my um, in my metrics. Um, and then I have been experimenting with, like if I have something sugary, I'll have some berberine after it to just try to mitigate those effects. But I haven't really been taking it because I haven't been having anything sugary lately. So think that's about it i don't think i'm missing anything i'll pipe in if i do sim if you would have to remove something what would you remove and why and what would you add and why i think in um, julie's protocol or in his own julie now we are on to advising julie i would you know i think with quercetin like there's not a lot of like uh, evidence right now and that applies to all the other synalytics as well. So like fisetin and and stuff, um, you know, theoretically they might work. Uh, but yeah, the problem is that, you know, you know, we don't know right now, okay, what's the correct dose or how much you need to use them <laughs> to remove senescent cells. Yeah, because we don't even have a reliable biomarker to measure senescent cells either. So it's like, okay, you don't know if it's working. So... Uh, Right now, at least, I wouldn't like. There's a few clinical trials that are being done on on this analytics, but uh, they, they'll come out in a few years. So, like, you know, I think it makes sense maybe for yeah, like if you're battling some sort of infection or COVID or something like that, to, to use quercetin or some fisetin or stuff. But um, as a like a general purpose longevity supplement, right now, I wouldn't like. Uh, that's why I'm not taking it myself uh, either. Uh, what to add, like. I, I think uh, the, the generally like very good supplements, maybe creatine and glycine and NAC are like the top ones, I think, for anyone over 40. So uh, they'll definitely be very beneficial for multiple like things like muscle and uh, body composition and and uh, strength and uh, antioxidant defense and things of that. So I got yeah. to tell you my experience with creatine. So and I know everyone tells me that this didn't happen, but because I don't vary my protocol i did add creatine and i had a significant amount of hair 
loss. And, um, you know, I've been told again and again that that's not true, but I'm like, well, I don't do anything else. So when I took it out, you know, the hair loss stopped. Um, it was more than just, you know, your average shed. So for, um, it sounds like there might be a genetic aspect to that, or it might mean a signal to, I'm still kind of trying to figure that out. Cause I would very much like to take that. I think it's a, a valuable, um, supplement when I look at the the data on it, but, uh, that was not a positive experience that I am interested in repeating. So I want to figure out why, whether it's a genetic thing or if it's, um, you know, another, a signal of an, not having some other mineral that I need to properly process that. But yeah, that was unfortunate, but I would never not recommend it to people based on my own personal experience. Big muscles are more important than hair. <laughs> Not as a lady with long hair, no. <laughs> I, would, I would argue the opposite. And what do you take, Sim? Uh, yeah, I take omega-3s, glycine, trimethylglycine. I take uh, hyaluronic acid, collagen, and uh, creatine. And that's uh, pretty much it, I think. Yeah, I take berberine as well occasionally and uh, melatonin occasionally as well. Dave, what would you remove and add? There were things like uh, maybe nicotinamide riboside that might be interesting for him, but I don't think he's to an age yet where he needs that. Well, that's right. I do take that. I take NR as well. That's what I'm forgetting. Next, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> so... Very quickly, everything that comes to your mind, just just say, and you guys pay people. attention. <laughs> uh -huh. Pay attention and try to spot the stupidest thing that he's taking. <laughs> Might be a shorter list to list the things I don't take. I mean, Seem did, what, an hour-long YouTube on my supplements? I mean, it's like not something I can just quickly rattle off, but gosh. I take so many things. I don't know where to begin. NR is one thing I definitely take because I noticed a huge difference when I began taking NR. So that was true niagen. I do take a lot of glycine, NAC, to creatine because those are things we just mentioned. So they're like top on my mind. I take a lot of things for like my eye health, for brain health, for heart health, uh, cardiovascular health. So yeah, usually I'm taking, I'm taking my supplements to target different organ systems, basically. Or I might be taking things to, you know, push autophagy at the time or, or for joints. Like I take glucosamine for the, my joints. And I, yeah, I'm just going to, could go off on a tangent there, but I'll, I'll not do that because that's all a different story. So yeah, I mean, that's, I, that's a brief, very, very brief summary because I could go on. It would certainly be a huge, huge tangent to go through your supplementaries now. Um, do you guys have any anything to to say about uh, Dave's Dave's approach or or supplements, or did you notice something that might be counterproductive? Yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, like what changes he made right now to his uh, the 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 supplements on his website, but uh, yeah, I guess it's yeah important to, or at least with supplements, like the way I approach it is that you know, okay does this supplement actually have any clinical trials in humans uh, to show that it has a particular effect or something? Because, um, you know, you could you could find some results for almost any compound in an animal studies and uh, then you're, like, left with, like, speculation. <laughs> like, okay, is this going to actually translate over to humans? And, you know, a lot of the companies might use that as well for marketing. Mm -hmm. Uh, to you know, make their product sound more appealing than uh, or more evidence based than it actually is. So you know, I guess the 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 biggest issue with supplements is that yeah, like the cost. Like I think if you're taking like dozens or hundreds of supplements a day, then you know you're spending a lot of money every month on on the supplements, and uh, you don't necessarily know if uh, if they work. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah. Other than that, like I, I, have no like, like fears about taking supplements. Even if you take like hundreds of them, the biggest problem is yeah, probably like the cost side, uh, and uh, even if they work in isolation, we don't know if they work if you take them all together. So that's just very like a complex, 
complex problem we don't know like answer to. Yeah, I, I took to heart your evaluation that you did in your YouTube and there were some great suggestions that you offered based on the, the timing of certain supplements. I switched those out. I think surprisingly, you actually encouraged me to increase the amount of some of the things that I was taking because the dosages weren't, um, they weren't in the range of what the studies showed were effective. And so to mm. that end, I, I believe I increased my glucosamine, ended up doubling that dose so that I was more in line with what the, the studies showed was optimal. And I think I did, I might've done taurine as well, but much to my surprise, I, I found that that was uh, not within the range of my bowel tolerance. And I ended up with a, a, a bout of diarrhea for quite some time. And it took me the longest time to figure it out as to what it was that was causing it. And so I ended up having to back those dosages down a little bit <laughs> and, then, and now everything's fine. But so sometimes even, you know, a study that recommends you know, what you should take mm. is not always going to be, it's not something that you might be able to tolerate either alone or in combination with a bunch of other supplements. Yeah, for sure. All right. Let's leave our listeners with some immediately actionable value. So I want to go around of answering one question. Pitch one low-hanging fruit biohack of yours that that's like easy to do, you're doing it, and it actually made a difference. I think, you know, exercise is the best best way, uh, or maybe like sauna. I think the sauna will also have very good cardiovascular benefits. So I, I, I like to say, yeah, like exercise is number one, and sauna is probably number two for like overall health I, don't to, I hate to agree i mean i, I mean aside from a, a healthy diet you know full of vegetables and healthy meat sources and or protein sources i'll say um only because i know like i was already doing that before i had my zero like my zero month pace of aging score and um at six months is when I added, you know, a serious exercise and sauna routine, and that made a 3% difference in my pace of aging. So I would agree that those two things together, especially can move the needle significantly and they're just easy to do. And it's fun to just, you know, get out, move around, make it fun. And then, you know, the sauna, I definitely think it's great, but if you can't get to it, just, you know, at least prioritize the exercise. And then, of course, I mean sleep, but if you're going to do one thing, exercise. Yeah, yeah. I think my, my sauna made a huge difference for me. Uh, just how I look and how I feel. Nicotinamide riboside made a big difference in my energy levels. Mm -hmm. My Carol bike made a noticeable difference after some time in uh, my run performance. So those, those would be like the top three that I think were the most noticeable for me. Okay, let's try this again. So... It has to be a low-hanging fruit. It has to be something that's practical mm. and very small. I, it, let, let's 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 just relax the criteria. It has to make a a small difference. All right. So maybe maybe I would put my uh, let's say let's say I have this uh, this this whatnot. I put it on and turn it on, and every morning. Uh, when I'm on the computer, I put this thing on and it beams blue light into my my eyes and it has zero cost to me and it might make a difference. I'm actually not sure. No. Your turn. <laughs> well, I, I can pick one. I've got uh, just putting on a red light in the evening or putting on blue blocker glasses pretty very very simple and it helps me to uh, start getting sleepy and I, I sleep better when i do that okay well so yeah i mean if you want to really like a walk every evening after dinner not only are you getting the the light but uh turn on some really calming music and it's just a like i don't look at my phone anymore it's a signal like the day is over uh it's just become this very relaxing addition to my day so um i would say even if it's a 10 minute walk uh, i don't think that costs people very much time most people can come up with 10 minutes and and find some very relaxing music we don't talk about this enough but i do think that that has an impact on our on our stress levels and 
So, you know, whether you want to amp those up or down, depending on what music you put on. So I think, yeah, that's what I would choose as a low hanging fruit. I would, yeah, put like morning sunlight, probably that getting exposed to this morning bright light is going to be for the circadian rhythm beneficial. And that, uh, you know, with the synchronized circadian rhythms, you'll, your body will also just, you know, be healthier. Those answers do satisfy me. <laughs> so thank you guys very much. At the end, I would like to do something that I've never done before and I'm not planning to do. But uh, every YouTuber are doing it. And I right now, I really do need you guys' feedback. How did you find this episode? This was an experiment trying to bring together rejuvenation athletes. What did you like? What did you not like? And, and how can we improve for next time well thank you guys it was really great thank you thank you let's do it again sometime <laughs>